Good afternoon, and for those of you joining us from overseas, good morning and good evening. Welcome to the 2020 NTM and Bronchiectasis Virtual Patient Conference. I am Amy Leitman, Director of Policy and Research for NTM Inform Research, and I will be serving as moderator for today's session. On behalf of all of us at NTMIR, thank you for joining us. The topic for today's webinar is airway clearance, and we are delighted to welcome Dr. Pamela J. McShane as today's featured guest. Dr. McShane attended medical school at Loyola University Stritch School of Medicine. From there, she became a recipient of the Health Profession Scholarship Program in the United States Air Force. Following her medical school and internal medicine residency training, Dr. McShane served as active duty in the U.S. Air Force at Wilford Hall Medical Center. She was stationed at La on Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. While on active duty, she was deployed twice to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. After fulfilling her military obligation, Dr. McShane returned to Chicago, where she continued her fellowship training in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Chicago. Dr. McShane was invited to stay there as a faculty member where she directed the Bronchiectasis and Pulmonary Non-Tuberculous Mycobacterial Clinical Care Center. During her time in the Clinical Care Center, Dr. McShane accepted an offer to work at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. At the NIH, she focused on clinical care of pulmonary mycobacterial infections. Dr. McShane has published extensively in the field of bronchiectasis. Through all her training, she has found clinical patient care to be the most rewarding aspect of her job. Dr. McShane recently moved to the University of Texas Health Center at Tyler, where she continues her love for clinical patient care and clinical research in bronchiectasis and pulmonary mycobacterial infections. During today's webinar, you may ask questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Click on the Q&A icon on your screen, type the question into the box, and then click send. At the conclusion of Dr. McShane's presentation, the moderator will read questions from the queue for Dr. McShane to answer. Today's webinar broadcast is being recorded and will be posted online at the conclusion of the seminar series. So if you miss the answer to a question that is asked, you will have the opportunity to hear it again at a later date. Don't miss our upcoming webinar presentations, Reducing Exposure and Reinfection with Dr. Rachel Thompson, Sunday, October 11 at 7 Eastern, Medication Management, Friday, October 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Julie Philly. Fight Back with Food, Sunday, October 18th at 2 p.m. with Michelle McDonald. And Coping with Chronic Illness on Friday, October 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Kristen Holm. Our thanks to InsMed, Aflovest, Spiro Therapeutics, Maxor Pharmacies, and Beyond Air. We are so grateful to our sponsors for their support of this program and for all the work they do to develop new therapies to benefit NTM and bronchiectasis patients. After this webinar, we will be sending you a link to more information about these amazing companies to give you a chance to learn more about them and everything they're working on. You'll be able to read more about their work, view informational videos, and find links to their website to learn more from them. At no other time has there been this much interest in, in and work on NTM and bronchiectasis. This is a very exciting time for all of us, and we encourage you to check it out because these companies play an integral role in fighting these diseases, and the work they do directly impacts all of us. You can learn more about NTM Info and Research and sign up for our electronic news at ntminfo.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And now I would like to turn this event over to Dr. McShane. Dr. McShane, welcome and thank you for being here today. Well, thank you so much um, for having me today. I'm gonna talk to you about one of my favorite topics. And frankly, this is a talk that I spend the most time on when I see patients. All of you listening today, so you have to do airway clearance um, because airway clearance, it, it, it removes sputum, and a lot of you sitting there listening to me right now might say, well, I don't produce sputum. That, that is only one aspect of what airway clearance benefits people. Um, so if you're not producing a lot of sputum, there is still benefit to doing airway clearance, okay? 
um, and we can review that. Um, and there is some data to support that. But so this applies to you even if you don't produce a lot of sputum. The other uh, important aspect of airway clearance is that it's recommended by multiple international guidelines. And, you know, it, it, there's a reason why experts come together because, and decide what should be recommended in an international document that recommends the optimal treatment for bronchiectasis and pulmonary NTM disease. It's because we think it works. So uh, that's another reason why to do airway clearance because experts recommend it. And then it also improves the mucociliary transport system. So um, in bronchiectasis, it's this mucociliary transport system made up of cilia or hairs that line the airways that move the sputum forward. And this is um, damaged in bronchiectasis and NTM disease. So the, the airway clearance helps fix that deficit. And then in addition, I will go into some detail and explain to you why a cough is not very effective at producing sputum. So uh, we advise airway clearance because it's more effective than coughing. Okay, I wanna take a step back and review that what you have in your airways is sputum. That is different, different fundamentally than mucus. So on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm telling you what mucus is. Mucus is normal substance that's secreted from normal airways. It is made up of like a mucin glycoproteins, and it actually has an anti-inflammatory property to it and antimicrobial properties. And mucus is cleared very easily by cilia. I have a little cartoon below here that shows the cilia hairs moving mucus forward. Mucus is very light, it's very see-through, it's very healthy, it's very good. But bronchiectasis and NTM patients have in their airways is different. They have sputum, and that's when mucus becomes infected by bacteria and becomes uh, stagnant uh, due to the abnormalities of the airway. And that becomes a, a much heavier, much more inflammatory substance that actually is damaging by sitting down there. So it's important to move that sputum out of the airways. Okay, and, and because fundamentally that's different than mucus. Now I mentioned international guidelines that all recommend airway clearance. It's recommended by the British Thoracic Society. It's recommended by the, the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand. It's recommended by the European Society. And although there's a formal uh, American recommendation yet, the, uh, a, the general uh, sort of review paper accepted as the current guideline uh, advises to do airway clearance in the United States. So multiple experts in these various countries have gotten together and they are advising patients to do airway clearance. I want to uh, review what a normal cough does. Um, and this is this be interesting to you who, uh, all of you who cough all day long and find that it's not always effective at producing sputum. Um, so normally a cough clears bronchi at the seventh and eighth generation. So as you know, bronchi, the trachea bifurcates or it separates into two airways and that further separates into many, many, many different um, uh, generations of airways. Well, cough should at a normal patient clear to seventh or eighth generation of these airways. The cough involves this deep inspiration, the glottis closes, and then there's this high pressure, 300 millimeters of mercury, intrathoracic pressure that causes dynamic compression and shearing force on the airway. And that leads to this explosive and turbulent flow rate that can be 500 liters per minute. And again, that is what occurs in the normal patient with normal intact airways. Now in bronchiectasis, the airways are not normal to begin with. And so coughing does not produce the same result because the airways cannot handle that high pressure. 
and those floppy airways uh, become unstable during that high pressure event of a cough. And so this reduces the expiratory flow and therefore the effectiveness of the cough. And this is why patients with bronchiectasis and NTM will, will tell me they cough their heads off and they're very bothered by this re re you know, recalcitrant coughing, but they don't always get the sputum out. Um, and just to uh, explain further to you, for those of you who have been sort of diagnosed with pulmonary NTM, I'm using this word bronchiectasis a bit. Generally speaking, patients with pulmonary NTM, pulmonary MAC or pulmonary M abscessus have bronchiectasis. And so bronchiectasis is the anatomical abnormality that is, that is uh, existing in the airways predisposing these patients to this infection. And so much of these, this abnormality in coughing and in sputum is due to the fact that the bronchiectasis is. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Um, airway clearance techniques. This allows, what, they, what, what it does is it takes the cough out of it and it allows air to move behind the obstructed airways and ventilate the distal regions, distal meaning further away from the mouth. Um, airway clearance techniques, they manipulate the expiratory airflow in a way that more effectively propels the sputum up and out of the airways. Now, this is a very comprehensive slide, and I'm, you know, if you can see in your brain, these are all the modes of airway clearance. And the idea is that you're going to know about all of these and you're going to mix and match the, the, the uh, different modes to most effectively get your sputum out. In other words, this is a customized sort of menu of things that you should know about and select the ones that work the best for you. So there are, in the blue column, I'm showing you all the breathing techniques. There are active cycle of breathing, autogenic drainage, huff, and postural positioning. So these are all um, techniques that you can do by yourself by manipulating the pressure at your mouth and causing various types of exhalation. And I'm gonna go into more detail about these. These all kind of have an overlapping technique, which is sort of based in the huff cough. In the green column, we have devices, things that your pulmonologist or infectious disease doctor is going to give you to help you produce more sputum. And typically what these do is they apply a positive pressure at the mouth. And a lot of times they will also come with an oscillation um, a device that helps the mucus move. And so these devices are things like classically a positive expiratory pressure device, and that's like the aerobica, the acapella, and I'm going to show you some slides on those things. And also another device, a bigger device, of course, is the high frequency chest wall oscillation. And many people refer to this vest, but we have to remember that the vest is a proprietary name. And so, you know, the word for this is high free chest wall oscillation. So those are the devices that one can use. The orange column, the nebulized solutions, should be used by most patients on a daily basis. And this is classically the salty solution, the hypertonic saline, 7%, 3%, this is much, uh, much more salty than what your normal blood content of salt is, which is considered to be like 0.9%, less than 1%. So compared to what your blood has, this is a much saltier environment. And then in some instances, patients use albuterol, and we'll talk a little bit more about why albuterol can be important. And then assisted, Assisted mechanisms of airway clearance is considered like percussion. When you have a partner who can clap your back, 
and initiate percussion. And we'll talk about that. I'll show you. So basically, this is like an outline for what we're going to talk about. And it includes many different air clearance techniques. So we're going to go back to the breathing techniques here. And I'm going to go into more detail on the active cycle of breathing. So the active cycle of breathing is a series of controlled breaths. And it begins with a deep inspiratory hold of three seconds. And is, that seems like kind of a benign, nothing thing to do. But that deep inspiratory breath hold is actually very important because it, it spreads the airways open from the mucus or the, or the sputum. And then after that breath hold, the patient kind of recovers and does some normal controlled breaths. And then they do the huff cough. And the huff cough looks like this. A patient is, can be um, sitting in a chair and they exhale the way, they, the way you would exhale in order to fog up a mirror. That's sort of the huff maneuver. And you're, you are, when you do acting, you do these huff coughs at low lung volumes and then increase to higher lung volumes. And each time you should be trying to put fog on a mirror. Another way to make a huff cough effective is to use a little exhalation tube, wrapping your mouth around the tube and, and exhaling. Um, this can be, you, the tube that you can use for this can come with your nebulizer sometimes. You have this with, uh, included in your nebulizer kit. And so you can use that. And when you, you, when you exhale onto this tube, it should be strong enough to, to move a tissue uh, with your exhalation force. Now I'm including this, this website here. And for those of you um, in the audience who may be my patients, you've probably heard me um, advocate this website that's in the left lower corner. It's bronchiectin com.au. It's from Australia. It's an excellent, excellent website. Um, and it shows videos of these huff cough and these active cycle of breathing maneuvers. And I strongly recommend that you all um, take a look at this website. Um, the, you might wonder why it matters to do this huff cough. And this huff cough is important because not only does it increase the expiratory airflow causing a higher, like a linear of the flow of air. When doing this, it increases the surface liquid in your airway. And that increased surface liquid helps to thin out that sputum and get it out. There's also a shearing effect that breaks mucus away from that wall of the airway. And that is helpful. To, to get the air, to get the sputum out. But it's very important to recognize that the, by definition, what a huff cough does is it changes a pressure point in the airway, which I'm showing you at the right side of your screen, where the pressure point in a huff cough maneuver or in an active cycle maneuver, the pressure point in that airway gets shifted so that it allows this to actually get out of your airways or sputum. This pressure point is much more effective and in a much better position in a huff cough because it moves that pressure point all the way out to the periphery. And compared to a cough, a traditional cough, when you're not using these techniques, where the pressure point is very close to the, much closer to the mouth, you're allowing that further away sputum to be released and to get out of the airway. So it's a very physiologic, important maneuver to do to help you get rid of that sputum. There are other uh, physiologic basis for active cycle of breathing. When you do that breath hold, if you look at um, the, the little cartoon to the far left of the screen, it leads to something called interdependence. By taking a breath hold and holding your breath and, and maximizing the volume in your chest, 
it causes the airways or alveoli, the, the airways and the terminal air sacs, which are alveoli, to open up. <clears throat> and they exert pressure on other alveoli to open up. And this in, con in concert causes a improved um, airway opening to allow more sputum to get out of the airways. It changes the airway, the conducting airway size. Moving to the middle of the screen, it, it also causes a collateral ventilation whereby when the pressure increases in one air sac, it leads by, by way of small communications to the neighboring air sacs, it opens up the neighboring air sacs. By, and this improves overall ventilation. Now, pendula flow is another concept that we talk about as pulmonologists, whereby improving the ventilation in one alveoli and air sac improves the ventilation of another neighboring air sac. So it, it makes the overall ventilation in your lung more homogenous. This, is, this can be very, very helpful and overall lead to improved uh, ventilation for your um, bronchiectasis and NTM lung disease. Autogenic drainage is also shown on the website that I've given you, the www.bronchiectasis.com.au. This is very similar to active cycle of breathing, but what it is is it's uh, utilizing or you know, capitalizing on these physiologic concepts and taking progressively increasingly large breaths and then exhaling using the huff cough technique. And over a series of breaths that lead to unsticking the sputum from the airways, collecting that sputum into the more central airways and allowing you to get that sputum out. <clears throat> Again, because these, these small changes in how you're doing these breaths, based on the physiologic mechanisms I said in the, in the slide just two slides ago, this improves overall ventilation in obstructed, obstructed regions of the lung. And it avoids that collapse that we see that occurs with a traditional cough because you're modulating the pressures inside the airways and you're allowing for those airways to stay open so that the sputum can come out. So this is very, very important and very worthwhile to look at that video and watch the patient on the video do these procedures. Um, and, and the nice thing about these airway clearance techniques is that you can do them anywhere. At any time. I'm going to move on now to the positive expiratory pressure devices. I would suspect that most of you in the audience have heard of these. Um, and I'm going to show you several at this time. So <clears throat> there's the acapella device, and there's lots of different types of acapellas. Um, some of them I prefer over others because some are more easy to clean. Um, they all, uh, some of the colors you can actually take apart the whole thing, not just the mouthpiece, but you can open up the whole canister and clean the entire, uh, entire uh, device. Some of them on the end of a built-in nebulizer port. And so I am in favor of uh, patients who sometimes connect their acapella to hypertonic saline nebulizer, and that allows them to to perform the acapella in combination with the nebulizer. <clears throat> you can ask your doctor if that's acceptable to them if you do that, but the nice part about that is that's a time saver. <clears throat> Within that acapella is this sort of, this plug and magnet that creates oscillations, and it's that oscillation that you hear that helps shear the sputum off the side, the walls of the airway. Now the flutter valve, I don't see quite as commonly, 
Um, the flutter valve is a little thing here shown here and it looks like a little pipe and inside it has a ball that rattles and it produces the same effect. It causes oscillation sensation and a positive pressure, both of which help remove the sputum off the wall. An aerobica or aerobica or aerobica, depending on how you like to uh, pronounce this. Again, it's a very similar device. Inside it has an oscillating <clears throat> component that causes an oscillation or kind of what feels like a vibration in the chest, which moves the sputum. And also like the acapella, the aerobica can potentially be connected to the nebulizer device. And again, I kind, I kind of like that. Your doctor may or may not you know, support that maneuver, but I, I find that it helps because it saves some time with airway clearance. These, if you're wondering, the, the oscillation, it, it has a frequency of like five to seven hertz. Um, that improves airway uh, mucus clearance because you, the cilia that line the airways, they beat at a very similar hertz and trying to mimic what cilia would do if they weren't damaged by your disease. And then that positive pressure <clears throat> that, that is exerted by putting your mouth on that resistor, it it imposes like somewhere around 15-ish centimeters of water or pressure. And that's good because it opens up those airways. As I mentioned, your cilia, they beat at a frequency also of like 11 to 13, We're trying to mimic what they would do if they were healthy. So again, saying similar things is what I've said before, that oscillation that that's, that that's accomplished by using one of those devices like an aerobica or an acapella. It improves the properties of the sputum. And the, the real properties, what that means is it improves the movement of how that sputum gets out of your chest. And specifically what it does, it decreases the rigidity of this of the mucus or sputum it improves the spinability which is the thread forming capacity when it when, when that mucus feels viscous and thready and it this results in improved cough clearance and that positive pressure that we we talked about what that does is if you can see without the positive pressure, the airway is narrower. And when you exert that pressure at the mouth, it opens up the airway, the airway is bigger, and it allows sputum to get out of your airways. I mean, the advantage of these devices are that, generally speaking, they're expensive. I mean, compared to a high frequency chest wall oscillation, they're, they're much less expensive. They're fairly easy to use. It doesn't take too much space to keep them. And it doesn't, um, you know, it's not hard to carry them around. Many patients, many patients will tell me, but I don't produce sputum with this. And I hear you, I understand that I have spent this whole time telling you to do this because it improves the sputum clearance. And you may say, but I don't produce sputum. I would still argue that the effect that this device is having on your airways is still beneficial in keeping them healthy. I sometimes compare it to, you know, every night I floss my teeth. And I floss my teeth because the dentist told me to do it, but I also do that because I've been told that the floss interrupts the biofilms which the biofilms harbor the, the bacteria. It's the exact same things in your lung. The lung, it has biofilms in it, which harbor bacteria. And when you get in there and you oscillate back and forth and you apply a positive pressure, it kind of interrupts that whole process. And so even though every night when I floss my teeth, if I don't get a big hunk of food out on the, on the dental floss, 
I still floss my teeth every night. And so even though you don't get a huge hunk of sputum out when you do your airway clearance, you, sh you should still do airway clearance. Okay, so that's, that's I, I tend to be a nag about airway clearance. So that's, that's sort of a little bit of my nag uh, soapbox there. I'm going to move on to high frequency chest wall oscillation. High frequency chest wall oscillation is a, a, it's obviously a bigger device. There's several companies out there that produce these, uh, I, I hate to say vest like subs, because it is a, like I said, it's a proprietary word, but um, there's several companies. Um, and the benefits of high frequency chest wall oscillation are that it also improves the rheological properties. Again, that's improving the viscosity, improving the liquid component. It's helping the sputum get out and move. And it's, um, and creates sort of this flow bias, which is um, favoring mucus getting out of the airways. For sure, it's been shown that this, these oscillation devices Im improve or enhance the ciliary beat frequency. Um, and it, it creates an expiratory flow. This, is, this EFR is peak expiratory flow rate. It increases that so that it's sufficient to overcome the mucus sticking to the, to the airway wall. Now, I have some concerns about this because um, what, the, what the high frequency chest wall oscillation does not do is it does not cause, force the patient to take that big deep breath before. Um, and I still think it's very important that you all include that big deep breath because the, the oscillations of the vest will kind of push lungs down to a lower volume. And so it's very important to remember to take those big deep breath holds before you use this high frequency chest wall oscillation. It also does not provide that positive pressure. So I sometimes think it's important to make sure you have a acapella, aerobica, or flutter in combination with these vest devices um, because uh, that positive pressure equally is important. Here is a picture of percussion. Um, this is something that your partner can do if they're willing. I find it to be a great exercise for my, my own triceps. So whenever I have a patient in my office, I always, I try to get a little, little percussion in for my own arm workout, but this can really be helpful for some patients. Um, it's very old school, it's free, but it does require a willing partner. Um, Postural positioning, I, I apologize, this slide is not very clear, but postural positioning is um, getting your affected area of bronchiectasis and NTM lung disease in a lower position than the hips, or it, and that is if your disease is in the lower lobes. Um, I'm showing a close up here. For those of you who have pulmonary NTM disease, the most common area is in the right middle lobe. And so this is a exercise which shows this patient maximizing gravity, you know, they're kind of exploiting gravity to improve the drainage of the sputum there. The right middle lobe is right beneath your right breast. And so if you get the, that part of your lung lower than your hips, and you kind of lie on your left side, that optimizes opportunity for gravity to improve drainage out. Now, please don't do this after you had, you know, a big plate of spaghetti and, you know, you have a full stomach. This is something to do if you're not, you know, really affected by gastroesophageal reflux disease, and you should do this on an empty stomach. I mentioned very early on that, you know, airway clearance needs to be customized. You should know about everything I've just discussed, um, but you will find one particular thing that really works best. I've also found that people 
have times of the day that are optimal for them to produce sputum. Some people produce more sputum at, in the afternoon. Some people produce more at night. So, you know, capitalize on that and, and do all these techniques at that time. Uh, so I'm going to transition now. I've talked about all the devices. Now I'd like to go into the nebulized agents. I've always been a big fan of hypertonic saline. And, and part of that reason is because of this small study that was performed in 2012 already. So it's already kind of old, but I, th I thought it was an important study. This was a study performed in the UK. It was a um, blinded, prospective, and randomized 12-month study where some patients received normal saline. So some patients received normal saline and some people received 6%. In the UK, they use 6%. Um, and they, were, they did this every 12 hours. What they found is that at the end of that 12-month period, quality of life improved actually in groups. Now what this tells me is that if a patient feels slightly you know, irritated by the hypertonic or what we call 7% or 3%, that they will probably have just as good improvement in quality of life if they use a, a much less salty solution, which is 0.9%. In addition to improving quality of life, they found that of the patients who used the 6% hypertonic saline, they looked at cultures at the beginning of the study, at the beginning of 12 months, and 55% of the patient who used hypertonic saline had positive cultures at the start of therapy. So positive cultures means something bad in their sputum like pseudomonas. And then at the end of the study, only 15% had uh, positive cultures. That's very, very important. What that tells us is there's some antibacterial effect of hypertonic saline. And so I feel like that's one of my favorite aspects of it. And I have, I have continued to see that in real time, that my patients, it, they have improved bacterial load after using hypertonic saline. Now, hypertonic saline, it can cause chest tightness and wheezing in a very small group of people. I would say that of maybe 100 patients, maybe three or five are gonna have tightness and wheezing after using hypertonic saline. And so it may benefit the patient to use inhaled albuterol prior to the hypertonic saline. Another study of the long-term benefits of airway clearance and bronchiectasis, they looked at the uh, lying down in the lateral position, much like I, I showed you with the right middle low bronchiectasis, this picture where the person was lying on, an, on a decline position, and then doing the huff coughs, which is, is called the glottis opened in lateral position. So I'm sorry that this is a little bit different than how we referred to it in the last slide, but basically this is like doing a huff cough like what I showed you in the prior slides. When patients did that over a one year period, they had improved sputum removal, reduced exacerbations, that dreaded complication of bronchiectasis where all of a sudden you feel worse, and they had improved quality of life. So that's the data on, some of the, some of the data on airway clearance in bronchiectasis. And so in conclusion, I think that, you know, patients should do bronch, should do airway clearance because coughing is just not an adequate maneuver for airway clearance. And airway clearance enhances ventilation and has been shown to improve quality of life. 
and then airway clearance can be customized to how you find it to be most beneficial for you. So I hope I told you something that maybe was new or you learned something and I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Dr. McShane, thank you very much for that really wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, we have um, a whole series of questions in the queue, so I'd like to start off now and, and start reading some of those and you can give some answers and some uh, uh, enlightenment to all of us for these. Um, question from one of the attendees, are there any new things offered on airway clearance to prevent NTM? Um, okay, so there's two questions in there. Um, are there anything new and then preventing NTM? So we don't have data that says that this prevents um, pulmonary NTM, but I will, I will argue that, that airway clearance is your best, is your best investment to preventing NTM. So I'm going to go with the new thing now. And I see another question in here that relates to this specifically. There is a new mechanism called Volera. It's produced by Hill-Rom. This is the, uh, this is like the Bentley of airway clearance or the Uber Cadillac or the, or the, just the high end. Um, I have watched this work on uh, several people. So it's like a little, um, it's like much bigger than a ventil than a nebulizer machine and it's on wheels and it comes with a device your mouth connects to um, like one of your nebulizer mouthpieces. And I, I'm, I'm, a fa I'm in favor of this device because what it does is causes you to have that increased positive pressure in the beginning and then it provides almost the oscillation at the mouth so that you can almost experience what the high frequency chest wall oscillation does, but it does it inside your airway by putting your mouth on this mouthpiece. It, it might be best, it's, I'm probably, it's a hard uh, device to describe in words. It might be best to Google it. But yes, I have seen this. I've started using it in the clinic when I want to induce, um, when I want to induce patients. And I really feel that this is a, a, hopefully we can get this more and more for our patients to have in the home. I think it's a great device. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Hello, I have mild bronchiectasis and mild Sjogren's. Because of the Sjogren's, I am never able to bring up any sputum for sputum culture, even when I nebulize with 7% saline. I also use my AfloVest. Any suggestions and what research has been done on NTM patients who have Sjogren's? Okay. Um, uh, so Sjogren's is difficult and I'm actually pleased to hear that you even that you tolerate the 7% because many patients with Sjogren's suffer from dry mouth and they um, is, find that the airway clearance is difficult from that aspect. Um, again, I, I think that the what the airway clearance is doing inside your chest wall with regard to the positive pressure and the improved ventilation is still worth the time to do it even if you're not producing sputum. There is, um, you know, I actually just reviewed a paper on, on the presence of NTM in bronchiectasis, but it has not been published yet. So um, I'm not really at liberty to, to talk about it, but um, there is, I mean, this is a known association. And, um, and I think, it's, you know, it, potentially can be complicated because your treatments that are for Sjogren's can affect your vulnerability to NTM. So this is, um, I guess I would say it's an association that we know exists. I don't think we're at the point where we have any 
physiologic um, basis to change treatment for those with Sjogren's and NTM. We still have to use the same treatments. Um, but I would definitely be um, encouraging you to seek a expert in um, NTM and bronchiectasis near you who has sort of their finger on pulse of um, what would be relevant for you with your concomitant Sjogren's. Okay, thank you. And um, I will be sure to uh, follow up with you. Um, so when we when that paper is published, we can uh, put out information about it for the patients. A uh, patient asks, I use Mucinex and walk at the ocean in New Hampshire. The air there seems to help me expel sputum. Is it your understanding that unlike other bodies of water, the ocean does not contain NTM or MAC? Oh, okay. Um, so um, was, the, was the question um, out? The you, question was about um, NTM in the ocean. Is there oh, okay. NTM present in the ocean? And then they also asked, I guess, Mac specifically, but uh, I guess, is there any NTM in the ocean as well? Yeah, so um, the, historically, that there was a sort of a myth or lore that, you know, kids ha who have cystic fibrosis, um, who, as you know, have bronchiectasis, um, those who live the, by the ocean did better um, and that's why they instituted this hypertonic saline treatments. I, I don't know if that's actually really true, but that's the lore. Um, we think that, uh, we know that NTM prefer a brackish or mildly salty environment, um, but not to the extent that your 7% hypertonic saline is. Um, it's probably helpful to to walk on the ocean for two reasons, because you're getting nice fresh air and you're getting exercise and that's good for airway clearance. We do think that there are bodies of water that are connected to the ocean that, in, that include NTM. And of course, Hawaii is one of the highest prevalent um, states that, contain, that has NTM. NTM is at very, very high prevalence in Hawaii which is of course surrounded by the ocean. So um, I think that it's, it's a little bit of a, a paradox that we think, you know, the ocean salty water is helpful in clearing your sputum, but at the same time, I do think that it, uh, you know, it, it, there is gonna be NTM in that water. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a patient who was diagnosed with NTM three years ago. They say uh, they've had a CAT scan every year. Their doctor recommended a nebulizer with 7% hypertonic saline, which they started in January of this year. Uh, they had a CT scan recently that's showing that their lungs are now hyperinflated, which is new. And they're wondering, could that be caused by the nebulizer? their nodules seem to be uh, increasing and in some areas and improving in others. And they're asking, what do you think is possibly going on in my lungs? Should they continue to use the nebulizer or stop? I would definitely continue to use the nebulizer. So I have focused on this disease for, you know, many, many years now. Um, and, you know, we do even in patients who have never used nebulizers before, um, we can look back and see their CT scans. There is some migratory behavior of NTM. Migratory, I mean that there can be nodules that come and go, um, and this is, this is not related to a nebulizer use. The nodules can come and go, and depending on the year your CT scan and the location, the uh, technique that was performed by the CT scanner can be more specific and more um, sensitive to pick up things like obstruction or air trapping. And um, so it's possible that the CT scan that you had in follow-up was just perhaps more uh, a, a thinner cut and was able to reveal these changes better. But we do not think that any of these changes are due to the nebulizer. 
um, because we see these changes occur in people who don't use the nebulizer. And I would still consider, I would really uh, continue using your airway clearance and nebulizer treatments. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Someone would like to know what your opinion of Aracase is. Well, um, I can tell you um, that Aracase has been a, an absolute godsend to us um, because what it has done is it's been able to um, give us an option for patients who have not converted sputum from positive to negative when taking the three drugs. So if patients are taking azithromycin, ethambutol, and ethampin, or a similar drug, and they're still not converting their sputums to negative, Aracase is now an option to treat those patients. Um, it is the only, the only FDA approved drug for this disease. Um, and, you know, I think that there is much more to come for Aracase. I think that those of us who use it, um, and again, it, it, it can be sometimes difficult to get used to, um, but with the right, you know, working through these uh, caveats and working through these potential side effects, patients get through it and become comfortable on error case. Um, I think that it's also going to have, I hope, a role in uh, mycobacterium abscessus in addition to a mycobacterium avium. That's my personal hope. Um, I think probably you're hearing through the line, you know, you're hearing my sentiment is that I am a big fan of it. I, I, I am a fan of it because it allows us to deliver a medicine direct to the lungs without uh, going through the systemic system and all the potential side effects that occur when people have to swallow a drug or take it by the IV. So I think Aracase is, I hope that Aracase is going to have additional uses beyond just patients who have pulmonary MAC disease. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Please tell us about cleaning of our nebulizers. We are all so paranoid about Antium in our water. Is it necessary to boil our nebulizer cups for 10 minutes after each use? Okay, there's several different um, mechanisms for cleaning. Boiling the water is one good way, um, but uh, I agree that you should not use tap water, but you should, um, you should clean it. Now, for those of you who are willing to spend some money, um, I recommend this, um, and I don't have any association with this company. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about the company itself, but there is something called a Wabi, W-A-B-I, baby bottle uh, sterilizer and dryer. And I've shown it to my patients that it's, it's sold on Amazon and you can dump your uh, nebulizer cups in there, close the top, walk away, and the thing will sterilize and dry your uh, nebulizer cups. Now, unfortunately, this thing is like $150, so it's an investment, um, but it does beat, you know, boiling water. There's also um, an alcohol method, I believe, and, um, but I now I'm not exactly sure the details of that. What I'll do is I'll send to Amy some of the other techniques that respiratory therapist recommends and she can have them. Amy, you can have those kind of available. That would be great. We will make sure we put them up on our website. And we'll let everybody know that they're up yeah. there. Yeah. And now just make sure though, if you are willing to spend that money, it is called a Wabi baby bottle and sterilizer, mm -hmm. but you have to get the one that with a dryer, because if you don't get the one with the dryer, then you know, you're going to have to take the stuff out at a certain time and let them dry. Okay, great. Um, question, if you don't produce much sputum, does airway clearance loosen it? And do you swallow the sputum or where does it go? I think oh. you mentioned already what um, does airway clearance loosen the sputum. You've talked about the importance of doing it regardless of whether you produce it. But uh, it's an interesting question. Where does the sputum go? Yeah. Um, so now I have talked with Dr. Gwen Hewitt about this at National Jewish, and she and she's very, um, she very much feels like she doesn't want her patients to swallow any sputum. Um, I I don't I don't think physiologically it's dangerous for you to swallow sputum. 
um, it, I think our body sort of resorbs uh, the sputum and it's a very, it's a, that's a really, it's sort of a, a sweet question because um, you have a point, like where does the sputum go? I think ultimately your body absor reabsorbs these things. It's just that we, we like to try to get it out um, because it has enzymes in it and it can further, um, uh, it can further hurt your airways if it's down there. But I think the moisture aspect of it gets resorbed by your blood vessels. Um, but I, I personally do not think it's dangerous to swallow sputum if you happen to have some in your mouth and you don't have a tissue. Okay, thank you. Um, an interesting question about labs. Uh, one patient notes that different labs um, required, such as Chicago, Mayo, Sinai, required different quantities of sputum in order to conduct tests, and they're wondering why there's such a difference. Yeah, so that's that is a complicated uh, answer because of it. It kind of. Um, um, by the way, I, I see a couple. I just want to go back quickly to the Wabi because there's a couple of patients who've uh, put up chats that one patient said I have a Wabi, and I love it. so just food for thought. Um, but back to the sputum. Um, so it's a very complicated procedure that occurs when you submit that sputum. So what they do is they decontaminate that sputum with detergents to get out the pseudomonas and all the other bacteria so that they can focus just on the AFB. And so different uh, universities or different hospitals may have slightly different techniques that they use for that. And it's partially, you know, how whoever comes in and runs the lab may, you know, put down a sort of a protocol and that says we want three MLs for this. Um, and at universities focus on this much more intensely will have, I think in my opinion, a slightly more sophisticated way of handling these sputum samples. So, you know, sputum samples are thing are sort of our thing at Tyler, and so we can take a very small plug, and you know, dilute it and add and add some saline to it and turn it into what we need to turn it into in order to process it for AFB. So it's just the protocol at each hospital can vary slightly differently. Um, like many things, you know, each each person is going to have their way of processing these sputums. What I think is a more important question than the volume is that most labs only identify mycobacterium avium complex to that level of the complex. And there are certain labs in the country that will identify what type of organism that is within the complex. And that can be helpful because some of the organism identities within that complex are more or less virulent and would warrant therapy more or less. So um, it's, the, it's the determination of what type of identity that, that MAC species has that I think is the most important difference in all these uh, universities. Okay. Thank you. Um, somebody has asked, who teaches patients about airway clearance? Who should we seek out to teach them about it? Yeah, I, this, is, this is hard because um, not every um, center has a respiratory therapist who focuses on this. So it, it's something that I, I sort of uh, teach my own patients um, how to do this. At each visit, we talk about, you know, we work on it, little aspects whenever they come in for follow-up. Um, but these videos that I, that website gave you in the talk, that bronchiosis.com.au, that shows videos. Um, and if you can kind of spend time watching those videos, I think you would get a lot of instruction. Um, but unfortunately, in the United States, unlike I think the UK, and it may be true for Australia as well, um, that 
you know, they have respiratory therapists who actually you can hire and, and, and teach, teach you how to do these things. We don't really have that as easily in this country. And so I think we have to kind of these, this MDMIR is a godsend because we can spread the word and share, share techniques and talk benefits and, and, you know, of these techniques and uh, work on it all together as a community. Thank you. Uh, speaking of breathing techniques and airway clearance techniques, um, we have a question about pediatric patients. Uh, they're asking, do you recommend the huff and other breathing practices for pediatric patients? Yes, most definitely, um, because uh, you know, it, as using cystic fibrosis patients as an example, that, that those patients have bronchiectasis also, and they get NTM disease. Um, they they latch on to these treatments really really well. They get really good at it, um, and seem to mind as much um, doing all this airway clearance. But it's every single bit as important for pediatric patients to do this as it is for adults. Okay, a um, couple of questions about hemoptysis. Um, one patient has asked, uh, if you have hemoptysis, should you wait a day before you do airway clearance again? And for those of us who have hemoptysis after doing a particular airway clearance um, method, um, is there any other method that you would recommend? Yes, thank you for asking that um, because that's super important. And um, there is no definite, you know, you must, uh, there's no definite uh, advice about exactly how to go about modifying airway clearance um, when you experience hemoptysis. And hemoptysis is blood in the sputum. And so the general guidelines say, when you experience blood in the sputum, stop the airway clearance for like you know, between one and three days, depending on how severe the blood was, and let it kind of, let yourself kind of recover, and then it reinitiate airway clearance. Um, airway, you know, hemoptysis is a difficult um, thing to talk about because there's such a variable extent of how much it can occur. And it can occur for two different, for three different reasons. It can happen because you have an infection and the airways are, you know, inflamed and infected and they get a little bloody and irritated. Then we want airway clearance because we want to um, improve the moving that infected sputum out of there. But hemolysis can also happen because if you're, the airway clearance can be irritating just by itself to a um, you know, exposed airway. And that's the times where we have to kind of think, okay, you know, we got to back off the airway clearance a little bit. Um, hemoptysis can also occur just because a particularly uh, enlarged vessel is in a bad spot and it's going to bleed. And if that is the case and it keeps happening, um, it may be probably better to discuss options for uh, kind of what we can kind of cauterize that area. Now that's um, much more complicated and probably beyond the scope of this talk, but um, you know, it's hemoptysis is, can be present for lots of different reasons, hopefully that, that was clear. And the best strategy is to take a little bit of a break away from the airway clearance for about a day to three days, and then slowly start back but if you get a little bit of blood, if that's sort of your MO, that you have a little bit of blood sputum after each airway clearance, that's probably okay to keep doing it on a daily basis. Okay, thank you. Um, an interesting question. Um, if I have MAI, which is M-avium intracellulari, does that make a difference? I was told that I shouldn't use saline by one doctor and was wondering if that was why. Uh, I, I guess I, I don't know why they would advise you not to use hypertonic saline. Um, we, I, you, I can tell you from my standpoint, for my patients with bacterium avium 
with mycobacterium intracellulare, I use hypertonic saline. Okay. Um, we have a, a few questions about um, the amount that, the amount of time you do particular therapies for. So um, lateral positioning, how long do you do lateral positioning for and, and how do you do it? Um, you know, how frequently should you do airway clearance um, for huffing and use of devices, morning, evening, number of times, that kind of thing. Do you have any particular kinds of, and also postural drainage, the percussion therapy. Do you have any kinds of recommendations in terms of the number of times or the length of time for those things? Yeah, so um, uh, again, this is where the customization really comes into, um, comes into play. And it also matters how severe your bronchiectasis is. So for people who have very, very, very mild bronchiectasis and, they, and they're not very sick from their NTM, then I will, um, I will say it's a probably okay to do it once a day. But for people who have more moderate affected lungs, um, I, they really should be doing weight clearance twice a day. Now with regard to how much to do it, um, you know, how much time each individual should spend. So the nebulization process usually takes between 15 to 20 minutes. And this can get longer and longer if the nebulizer is old or if it needs to be replaced. But I mean, 15 minute nebulization, you know, twice a day is adequate. Then when you're with the nebulizer, um, your doctor may have an opinion on how many breaths they want you to use the acapella or how many breaths they want you to do with the huff cough. What I think is best is at a minimum, you should be doing these breaths and acapella blows at a minimum of two or three uh, rounds of 10 breaths. That's, that's generally what I tell my patients to do, but your doctor may have a different opinion. But, but if you find that you have benefit after you know, a certain number of breaths and you don't feel much, you know, for, for your system, you find that your best collection of um, these procedures is a certain number, you know, that, that, that's okay. You, you can um, kind of customize it to what you think is working the best for you. And then I do think though that the positioning, if you don't have a lot of acid reflux and you can, and you can lie down in a lateral decubitus position that's sort of with a decline so that your, your chest is below your hips, and I think that needs at least about 15 minutes or 10 or 15 minutes to lie in that position so that you can give the, the sputum some time to move. Um, there was a, there was a, um, a question about so someone was told not to lie on their right side. And, and that comes from the physio or the anatomy that the gastroesophageal sphincter the, the, the sort of the gateway between the stomach and the airway or the esophagus and therefore potential to infect the airways is more open when you lie on your right side. And when you lie on your left side, it's more closed. So that's probably um, an important uh, reason why lying on the left is, is better. Um, but if acid reflux is not an issue for you, you don't have to worry about that as much. Great. Um, you had mentioned the nebulizer and the age of the nebulizer. Somebody asked about replacing it. Is there a particular time frame to replace it in? Is there a particular age that you should replace it at? Well, um, there's Medicare pays for, uh, I think, a new nebulizer at five years, I think. And this, that's a moving target a little bit because sometimes they change it. Um, on the other hand, you know, you can buy them whenever you want. Um, and the expense of them ranges. So like if you get it at your hospital where you see your doctor, it might have a better price. So for, for our patients, we, um, they can pick up a nebulizer at our pharmacy and it's, if they just pay for it outright, it's like $40 or $50. Um, so if that works into your budget, you can replace your nebulizer whenever you want. 
Um, you can also buy, uh, you know, all, all sorts of portable nebulizers that may facilitate when you can do your airway clearance in certain aspects of your life that make it more convenient. So there's, um, there's a, a portable nebulizer that's put out by Philips and um, it's very expensive. I think it's like $200, but it gets very good reviews from my patients. Um, it's a tiny little thing that's like the, sh the size of a, a deodorant that you would use. Um, and it's quiet to be. Um, and so you can, you can buy um, some of these smaller portable nebulizers. It, it reduces the workload that your other nebulizer has to do. Um, and so you can kind of have a little bit of a, you know, a collection of these things to, to improve the, the lifespan of them. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of questions still in the queue. So if you still have some more time, we'd like to probably sure. get, okay, great. Um, we have a couple of questions about Mucinex. Uh, do you recommend it? Um, Mucinex um, has been studied in bronchiectasis, not specifically in NTM patients, but basically about half the patients feel better on it and half the patients don't know any different. So if it makes you feel better, go ahead and use it. It's not bad for you. Okay. Um, here's another question. Um, can wearing a mask for COVID trap NTM? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think so. Um, you know, you mean, I mean, it would be trapping it. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I, I, I love answering these questions because sometimes they ask things that you ask things that I haven't thought of before. Um, but I, I think if you're asking, can it trap PM from the environment and hold it there and have you make it a reservoir of NTM that you can breathe in? Um, I, I don't, well, first of all, I can tell you that we have not studied that. That hasn't been outright studied, um, but typically the filters, the, the mechanism of the material that the, that the mask is, tr it does prevent it from entering your airways. And in that sense, it's trapping it, but it's not making it so that you have a bigger war to breathe it in. Okay. I hope that makes sense, answered your question. So, so it's, not, it's not increasing an exposure risk of any kind? No. Okay, no. perfect. I think that's probably was their concern. Okay. Um, so do you recommend seeing a respiratory therapist for help learning these techniques? And what is the best way to find a pulmonary or infectious disease MD or specialist familiar with your recommendations? Well, that would be you, Amy, right? You, you could direct people to all of us. I mean, I, I feel fundamentally kind of um, self-conscious about, you know, I, I'm doing this talk because I want to to help you all, but I don't necessarily feel right advertising for my clinic. I mean, I think that University of Texas and Tyler has a long history of, of NTM care, but, um, but I think there are several of us around the country who do an excellent job and are great doctors for this. And so Amy, the NTM IR can direct you towards someone in your area. Uh, yes, um, and that goes for anybody. If you are having trouble finding a specialist, please, you know, send us an email. We're happy to help you find somebody. Um, here's another interesting question related to COVID. What recommendations would you suggest for sterilization of nebulizing and flutter devices during COVID-19 since rubbing alcohol is almost impossible to obtain? Well, excellent point. Um, so you uh, will, you have the, the boiled water to lean on and consider if it fits into your budget, this Wabi baby bottle sterilizer. But, but the boiled water is an excellent way to uh, um, sanitize these, this equipment. Um, and I'll just say, you know, about COVID-19 is we, I have had a couple of patients who have tested positive and have, um, you know, uh, performed remarkably well, um, have not had significant symptoms. Um, so it doesn't appear that by itself, NTM and bronchiectasis are uh, 
factors which put patients at high, 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 higher risk. Um, it, it, it appears that they're behaving very similar to uh, patients who don't have bronchiectasis and NTM when they do test positive. Okay. Um, and uh, regarding, you mentioned the Wabi, if they have a baby bottle sterilizer that doesn't have a dryer, is that still okay to use? I think so. Yeah, as long as it has, it's the same mechanism probably. I just, um, this particular brand was recommended to me by another university. Um, but yes, if they have the baby bottle sterilizer and dryer, as long as it has the dryer, it's the same. How often would you say, if they're gonna be washing with hot soap and water and, um, and rinsing it every day, how often do, do you want them to sterilize? How often do you think they should sterilize it? I usually tell my patients once a day, if it's like, um, if they have one of those baby bottle things, because it's like, it's basically like putting your dishes in the dishwasher and running it. So I think once a day is, is good. Okay. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We have still have a lot of them. <laughs> um, what is the best way to read lab results? Several things are done in the process, stain, smear, et cetera. Perhaps you can- Oh, okay, that's a big, that's a big answer. So when you first get the, the lab first processes the sperm and they result, uh, what they do is they smear the sputum on a slide, a glass slide, and they stain it with um, different stains, and they look at it under the microscope. Stains allow, they reveal the organisms. So the very first day that's done with your sputum, and that's called the stain. It's also referred to at some institutions as the smear. So we'll, we can, if your sputum shows organisms at the stain or smear level, that is, suggests a higher burden of organisms. So that means that at that first look under the microscope, we see the organisms. And the, the degree of positivity there is like one plus, two plus, three plus, or four plus. And typically we feel that a four plus a three plus, you know, the higher plus, we would be more likely to treat that patient, even if they don't have a lot of symptoms. Then, so that's like the first sort of gestalt, if you will, of the positivity of that sputum sample. So that's called the smear or the stain. Then they take more of the sample and they put it in two different types of culture um, and they culture it, and the, it, there's a liquid culture and a solid culture, and it's cultured for uh, six weeks. And there's a growth that occurs over that six weeks, and many labs will report the amount of the growth, whether it's that, then there again, they give it like one plus, two plus, or three plus. And so um, it sort of just gives you an, a sense of how heavy the growth is. In all cases, the higher the plus, the more heavy the growth is. Um, so typically what the result will show in terms of AFB. Um, when they first, they'll do the same thing with non-AFB, meaning non-NTM bacteria. And they, they first do a here, and that short, sort of shows gram positive this, gram negative that, and then they take it and they'll culture it. And that's a much faster culture. So it's really just describing how the bacteria are, um, how heavy they are early on in the sputum, and then how well they grow. Okay. Um, another question about masking. Um, does N95 mask block NTM? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, if buildings that had stagnant plumbing during COVID can have bacteria for legionnaires, can the bacteria causing NTM also be present in these circumstances? Well, the, well, we know NTM is present in all sorts of plumbing. Um, 
everywhere from any building to our houses. And that's because it, it lives in biofilms and biofilms is that slippery substance that exists inside of a pipe. Um, and it's also in our water um, because it's in the soil and it enters the water from the soil. So, um, you know, regardless, it's, we always think, we always consider the water to have it. I do want you all to understand that it's really more about, the, it's, the, it's the genetic makeup and the environment of your lungs that allow the NTM to cause infection. Um, that key. And so, yes, you shouldn't be, you know, I don't want you to sit in a hot tub and inhale a steam of hot water that's going to be include that, that has a high concentration of NTM. But I also want you to get so overly worried about NTM in your water supply that you just don't live a normal life. You just, you have to do, I think it's better to spend your energy doing airway clearance and following the direction that your doctor tells you to do, then worrying too much about your exposure because we can't, you know, you can't live a normal life and not get exposed to it. Um, so, you know, I try, I try to, you know, relieve some of that extra angst that my patients have. You can do a couple of things that will help, and that's, you know, turn the water, uh, hot, hot water heater temperature up to like 130, 140. It is going to be an increased risk of scalding, so you have to be careful. But that hot water is better um, to uh, kill the bacteria in the pipes. And I tell my patients sometimes in the hot water every month to kind of clean out the, the pipes. I do tell them that their spouses should turn on and off or, or get a friend to turn on and off the, the water because it's going to have some steam in it. Um, that you can inhale the bacteria. Generally, if you run the hot waters like once a month, it has the chance or the potential of killing the bacteria in those biofilms. Um, and then don't take a shower in a, in a really uh, unventilated room with the doors all closed where you're breathing in the hot steam. Try to open up the door, the door keep the fan on, you know, and get one of those shower heads that has more of a, a larger it doesn't create as much of a steam. Okay. Um, let's see another, oh, a couple of questions about exercise and deep breathing. Um, how, how helpful is it for airway clearance and is it something that you can do for airway clearance? Yeah, when with kids uh, with like cystic fibrosis, we would exercise as one airway clearance. But again, those kids are doing airway clearance like three times a day. So, um, Yes, exercise can count as airway clearance, um, but I don't, um, depending on how severe the, uh, the bronchiectasis is, I still may want my patients to um, do uh, airway clearance twice a day. But exercise is phenomenal. It's good for all sorts of things, and I always encourage my patients to do all sorts of exercise. Okay. Um, can you rule out NTM or MAC with only a bronchoscopy, or is a sputum necessary as well? Uh, the guidelines say that you can um, rule out and diagnose um, MAC or NTM by either method. So, okay. yeah, either. Uh, are. And another question about bronchoscopies, are they helpful in reducing the NTM bacterial load? No, not at all. Okay. Um, so to prevent further MAC infection, should one avoid drinking or rinsing fruits and vegetables with tap water? Should one only use spring water? Oh, see, that's where I get concerned that, you know, you just, it, it can real this, the more you think about this and it can really, um, can really drive you crazy. And I would, I would argue that you could rinse your, I, well, let me let me just back up. There hasn't there hasn't been a study that analyzed fruits washed with tap water um, that shows that NTM is sitting on there. You know, later on when you go to go to eat it. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm speaking from you know sort of a more uh, sort of a logical standpoint here rather than a data driven standpoint. But I would be um, 
just based on my understanding of physiology and how uh, this bacteria behaves, I would allow my, I would encourage my own patients to wash their fruit with regular tap water and dry it off. And I, I think it's that's acceptable and not significantly or clinically increasing their risk of NTM disease in a clinically meaningful way. Okay, we've had a couple of questions about sinus, sinuses and sinusitis. So we have somebody asking that uh, my bronchiectasis is sinus driven. What advice do you have for me? I do two sessions per day plus airway clearance, but still have tons of draining mucus. From the sinuses. Um, well, I mean, that's, that can open up a, a much bigger uh, area of medicine because I, for patients who I have who have chronic sinus disease, I send them to a, well, we get a CT scan to see if their sinuses are amenable to surgery, which can improve things tremendously. Um, and then I always work to take care of them with a ENT doctor. Um, and so you're, you're correct in that, you know, sinuses and bronchiectasis do really go together. And it's very typical, it's not uncommon at all that patients have both of these diseases. Um, but I, I almost always manage these patients with ENT. And then I encourage them to do sinus irrigation with the Neal Med, uh, the Neal Med sinus rinse. Okay, um, another quick question about GERD and postural drainage. Um, is postural drainage not recommended if you have GERD or? Well, depending on how bad your GERD is, um, you know, it's generally speaking, it's not, it's not overly recommended in patients who have bad GERD. It could make the GERD worse. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so we have actually a, a couple questions about sputum samples. One of them is, um, how long is a sputum sample viable for? And then the other one is they do sputum samples bimonthly and it always comes back rejected due to or oropharyngeal contamination. No matter how little saliva enters the jar, what can I do to, to improve this? I cannot produce sputum on command. Um, so with regard to that, um, you know, some people just can't produce it. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have bronchiectasis and that you don't have pulmonary NTM disease. Some people just cannot produce sputum. And that's, that just is what it is. Um, so the, the, it's, it's during that period, it's during those types of samples that see the oral pharyngeal contamination, meaning it's kind of spit, um, or it's just not really a viable sample. And I think, you know, it may just be that you're one of those patients who just cannot produce sputum and that's not, it's okay. It just is what it is. Um, and in those patients, if they have real other symptoms that suggest they have, you know, a chronic infection, such as a lot of fatigue, you know, fevers um, and frequent illnesses, then I, then I do, bron do bronchoscopy on those patients. Um, for patients, uh, the viability of the sample, you know, it's best to get, you know, into the doctor right away. But, you know, you know, at Tyler, we have patients who we see from far away, you know, who live in different states, um, and they mail in their sputums, and it turns out just fine, um, it, especially because a lot of our uh, techniques are done by uh, DNA sequencing, and so um, less less on the culture growth. Um, so we can still pick up the organisms that are there, even if the sputum has bounced around in the mail for a couple of days. Um, so ideally, the sputum gets to the doctor as fast as possible, but it's it, it can still work if it has to be mailed in. Okay. Um... Let's see, we answered questions about exercise. Uh, are any organizations or groups working on US guidelines for bronchiectasis? Yes. Good to know. Yes, and I can't, I mean, meetings are ongoing and that's I think as much as I can say. Okay, good to know. 
Um, if someone has bronchiectasis, assist, should they continue with airway clearance for the rest of their lives? Yes. I, patients say, how long do I have to do this? And I say, you have to do this until you die. Okay. <laughs> um, going back to the sinus question for a minute, if somebody has heavy post-nasal drip, is, is there anything, is there anything that you would recommend to help decrease it? Well, I'm a big fan of the Neomed sinus irrigation, not the neti pot, but the, um, the one that is an eight ounce bottle and it has a black top. I, I like that one a lot. I usually tell them to do that. If there, if that, if there are complications related to that, then I, I really think it's important for them to see the ENT. Okay. Um, can, is, it, is it okay to combine different uh, therapies, doing different therapies at the same time, like maybe um, a flutter or aerobica and a vest or a nebulizer and a vest at the same time and stuff like that? Yeah, I do some tell my encourage my patients to do things together um, because again, this whole thing should be customized, and I think it works. It, it, the patient may find that connecting these things together can can really help them. Okay, um, how much time should you uh, should you? Um, put between using nebulized albuterol and nebulized saline? Uh, you don't have to um, you wait at all. For okay. If you oh, one of the patients that does albuterol prior, they can, I mean, al nebula, I should say, albuterol takes about 11, 10 minutes to work. Uh, but if they want to start the process of nebulizing right away, the albuterol will kick in when they need it. Okay. Um, do you approve of outdoor swimming pools and swimming in lakes? I do. Now, there's a variable, um, there's variation to uh, this, and that's because I, you know, we all want to speak from perfect data that says, you know, the, that's, this patients were, this, these patients swam in the lake and these patients swam in the pool. And, you know, we compared the two and they, one had more bronch, you know, NTM than the other. There's just not those studies available. So we all sort of give our gestalt. Um, but, you know, swimming is an excellent exercise. It incorporates postural position. It, you know, it, it's, it's a, it just phenomenal. And um, I'm very, I encourage my patients to do things that make them happy. So I like, I encourage them to do swimming if they like it. And again, it's because I recognize their vulnerability to NTM is beyond just the exposure. It's, it's there, there's a genetic vulnerability to getting NTM that probably goes beyond just their exposure. And I think as long as they do their airway clearance and we're doing everything else right, then they should do that makes them happy. Okay. Um, so with respect to um, do nebulizing medications and then doing airway clearance to cough up sputum, um, do you recommend doing one or the other first? Uh, yeah. So I start with the nebulized hypertonic saline. And then I have them, so I get the salt water in there and then I have them start doing the positive pressure with oscillation, the high frequency chest wall. And, the, and, um, and if they're gonna do postural positioning, I usually tell them to do that last. Do it last. Um, what about nebulized medications like antibiotics? Do those oh, first yeah. or afterwards? And so that the, all the airway clearance happens first and then okay. I tell them to wait 15 minutes and put the uh, antibiotic on top of cleans. Okay. Um, so here's a question. Um, are Medela bags, which are used for disinfecting baby bottles, sufficient for disinfecting nebulizer cups? Is it important to wash the cup first with soap and, and distilled or boiled water, or can you use tap water? Um, we. We typically advise not tap water, but you can rinse. It's okay if you're going to use a sterilizing system, then yes, you can rinse it quickly with tap water. That's okay because then you're going to sterilize it. So that's acceptable to use the tap water to quickly rinse it. 
Um, I don't know that particular uh, brand or item you mentioned as well, so I shouldn't uh, render an opinion on that. All right. Um, can, the, there's a question about the Wabi. Can you use it for the aerobica or just the nebulizer? Uh, I think you can, if you can fit it in there, you can use it for the aerobica pieces. Okay. So I think you should be able to fit it. All right. Um, one, we have time for, I think we're just going to, um, we're going to answer one more question because I think we've, we've taken a lot of your time already. Um, there's a patient with alpha-1 and bronchiectasis. Their bronchiectasis seems to be the bigger problem. Does having alpha-1 affect any of the bronchiectasis treatments that you've discussed? Uh, no, it does actually. So I, I do have a several patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin um, who are on replacement therapy. And luckily, we're able to use uh, everything we need to use in that patient. OK. All right. Thank you. Well, folks, we know there's a lot of questions left. We are going to, um, we're going to make a note of all those questions and try and get some additional answers for you. Um, but we'd like to thank you very much again on behalf of NTM and Phone Research. Thank you all for joining us today. We're really delighted that you joined us and we look forward to seeing you at our next session. Uh, I apologize for the technical hiccups um, and thanks to everyone who offered the possible solutions for them. We didn't get the opportunity to try all of them, but luckily the old tried and true, you know, you know, close it down and restart it, that worked in the end. We'd like to again thank our valued sponsors and our thanks to Dr. McShane for her excellent and really informative presentation for taking all this time today to answer all our questions. Thank you all very much and have a really great weekend, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.